When Abraham set out from his birth city, he had no idea that his faith would eventually be integral to at least three different religions, or that his hometown would become famous millennia later. Ur is one of the oldest cities in the world, and people lived there for at least 2,000 years, making it an important center of trade and culture that still affects us today. We would not be who we are without this great city, so stay tuned as we explore the rise, fall, and rediscovery of the city of Ur. Historians think that Ur was first established around 3800 BCE, during the last part of the Ubaid period. Historians split up early Mesopotamian history by developments in the pottery. Thus, the last part of the Ubaid period was known for having greenish clay and being made with a slow pottery wheel. At the time, that was a huge step towards industrially producing clay pots. In the beginning, Ur appears to have been a settlement of fishermen, hunters, farmers, and craftsmen. Although they were mostly self-sufficient, they didn't seem interested in gathering wealth like jewelry. Until about 2700 BCE, Ur's importance and power were negligible, but that all changed as Ur developed into a full city. Writing had just been invented, and the early cuneiform allowed people to send messages to each other across vast distances. This seems so obvious today because we see and use writing everywhere. Still, for the ancient people of Ur, writing was revolutionary. The first known kings of Ur that we know of from writing are Masanapada and his son Anapada, who ruled around 2600 BCE. The kings of Ur continued until the conquest of Sargon of Akkad, who was the world's first conquering emperor. He ruled from 2334 to 2279 BCE. Ur was so important to Sargon that he made his daughter, Edhedwana, the high priestess of the temple. Having such a powerful ally helped Sargon maintain control of the city by appealing to the common believers while giving him unlimited access to temple funds. This shows that Ur was so important that he thought he couldn't afford to lose it. When the Akkadian Empire collapsed in 2154 BCE, Ur slipped under Sumerian rule, led by governor ur -Namu who eventually disposed of the Sumerian king and moved all governing power to Ur. The city finally moved into a period of legendary prosperity and power. The third dynasty of Ur was definitely the high point of their history. Never before and never again would there be such an economic and political power in Ur. The city's control over Sumerian culture lasted over 100 years, from 2112 BCE to 2004 BCE. Five kings ruled during the Third Dynasty, and they all wanted to expand the empire while taking care of their people to the best of their abilities. That meant huge temple building projects, conquests of nomadic tribes, canals dug across the empire to give the people water, centralized agriculture, and creative works of literature and art. The first king during the Third Dynasty was ur Namu, who ruled Sumer from 2112 to 2094 BCE. He started out as the governor of Ur, but he quickly took over as the ruler of Sumer and began conquering cities. He is best known for his building projects, like the Ziggurat of Ur. Shulgi was the second ruler, and he ruled from 2094 to 2046 BCE. He is remembered as an even better ruler than his father, waging more wars with neighboring tribes, like the Shimaski dynasty, and building several impressive buildings, including the Irasak, or Mountain House. After he destroyed Der, Shulgi declared himself a god, but he died in 2046 BCE on the battlefield. The third ruler, Amar-Sin, ruled from 2046 to 2037 BCE, and he was the first who called himself King of all Sumer and Akkad, without ever traveling to Nippur. Although he engaged in many successful military campaigns, his most impressive accomplishment was building the Amar-Sin Canal which connected the Euphrates to the Itarungal River and made water easier to come by. The fourth ruler of the Third Dynasty was Shusin, reigning from 2037 to 2028 BCE. He was involved in a lot of defensive wars against various nomadic tribes, and he commissioned several building projects in honor of local deities. The final king was Ibisin, who ruled from 2028 to 2004 BCE. Sumer was weak because of the constant wars before Ibisin came to the throne, and it suffered many outside attacks from nomadic tribes. The other cities began to break away from Ur, and Ur eventually fell. 
The sacking of Ur was lamented in the poetry at the time, and the city never again regained the glory or prominence that it had during the Third Dynasty. After the destruction of Ur, several rulers tried to rebuild the city. The Larsa rulers came after Ibi Sin was deposed, and they rebuilt walls, temples, and treasuries. They reconstructed the city because Ur had excellent seaports, making it an important trade center. People moved back, and archaeologists found evidence that landowners, craftsmen, financiers, and other merchants had re-established themselves in the rebuilt city. Copper, ivory, and other precious metals were being imported, and Ur seemed to be on the verge of a revival when the Babylonians arrived. Hammurabi, king of Babylon, took the city in 1763 BCE. By then, he ruled most of southern Mesopotamia. But despite his power, Hammurabi was reasonably considerate, even building them an irrigation canal to help with crops. His son, Samsu Iluna, was less considerate. During a rebellion, he sacked the city, destroying his father's canal, which devastated the city for at least a century. However, Samsu Iluna didn't have much time to worry about Ur. He was dealing with outside nomadic tribes that were constantly attacking. In 1595 BCE, the Hittites sacked Babylon itself, ending all the city's real influence over Ur. Ur didn't have time to rest, though, because the Kassites moved in as soon as the Babylonians were out. They were a tribe from the Zagros Mountains that had grown powerful enough to take their turn ruling Mesopotamia. King Kurigalsu I began renovation on Ur, rebuilding some of the temples and the city walls. Nothing could stand, though, against the might of the Assyrians. When the Kassites gave way, Ur found itself under another empire's rule. The Assyrians did not think much of Ur because they already controlled all the waterways. They did not need to hold a busy trading port because they could import everything they needed from other places. Ur fell into a period of decline until King Nebuchadnezzar II came to the throne in 605 BCE. He restored Babylon beyond its former glory and beat the Assyrians. Ur experienced its last revitalization. They had new walls, restored temples, and a repaired ziggurat under the benevolent eye of King Nabonidus. After Nabonidus died, Babylon crumbled, and the Persians took their place as the next rulers of the region. The Persians did not pay much attention to Ur, and it diminished into a minor city with little to offer the empire. The final blow was shifting the Euphrates River taking away the people's main source of water. Rivers change over time, and at the end of the 6th century, the Euphrates shifted east, away from the city. By 500 BCE, the conditions had become so harsh that the city was abandoned for good. It would remain that way for centuries until it was rediscovered in the 1800s by curious archaeologists, who discovered that the dry conditions had preserved large sections of the city remarkably well. Archaeologists have found many different interesting objects and archaeological structures preserved in the ruins of Ur. But one of the most famous is the Ziggurat of Ur. It's a massive structure located just outside the temple complex. Historians think it was used as part of a major religious ceremony. It was designed to look like a mountain reaching up to the gods, and its flat top housed a shrine where someone could communicate with the gods directly. Archaeologists have also discovered the Royal Cemetery, which shows them more about the wealth and social hierarchy of the city during the First and Second Dynasties. Not all graves are intact, though, due to grave robbers. Historians have still managed to locate several works of art within the graves, including the famous Standard of Ur, which shows a victorious battle scene and celebratory banquet, and two statues of rams propped up against trees. The statues are wooden and covered with gold and copper, but historians do not know the exact purpose of these statues. They do, however, know the purpose of the Lyres of Ur, another major discovery from the ancient cemeteries. Music was clearly an important part of life in Ur, and there are four significant instruments in this group that were made from a combination of wood and metal. They range in size from 13 to 43 inches tall, and many of them are designed with bull's heads on them. Historians think that the lyres were part of the funeral ritual. Musicians would chant burial hymns before being sacrificed and buried with their instruments. Human sacrifice following the death of a ruler appears to be common, and royalty was sent to the afterlife with an entourage of servants, musicians, and guards. Based on the wounds on some of the bodies, 
Archaeologists don't believe this human sacrifice was always voluntary. Of course, historians have found other objects in the tombs, and everything works together to give a picture of what life was like during the long history of Ur. The city existed for about 2,000 years, and historians have documented political and social changes by the things people left behind. Socially, Ur started out as a simple city of fishermen and tradesmen. Trade certainly wasn't expansive yet, but it was an important part of their contact with the outside. Of course, Ur did not remain simple. Once they developed a dynastic system, life became much more urban and vibrant. They established classes, or castes, with the high priests and nobility at the top. The two groups were interwoven together, and often a high priest would declare himself king of the city. The other classes consisted of lesser nobles, common people such as potters and soldiers and slaves. Slavery was part of life in this growing city. Still, people could pay or work off their slavery, eventually getting their freedom back. Throughout their history, this basic social structure remained the same. The members of the highest caste frequently changed, which brought about social and political changes to the city. Still, the common people did not deal with huge social changes, although they saw adjustments in their living standards. Even after the first sacking of the city, the ordinary people were able to continue their lives. In fact, the city didn't really begin to die until the changes around them affected the common people. During the Persian Empire, trade began to move north, limiting the range of the tradesmen in Ur. The climate changes diminished the success of the farmers. The city died only after the common people could no longer sustain their community. In its 2,000-year history, Ur played an important role in Mesopotamia, but it is perhaps best remembered today as the birthplace of Abraham. He ushered in a belief in monotheism that is still prominent today in three major world religions. Although there is little evidence in Ur of Abraham's presence, his stories fueled the search for the city. Without him, archaeologists may never have rediscovered this powerhouse of Mesopotamia. To learn more about Ur, check out our book, Ur, a captivating guide to one of the most important Sumerian city-states in ancient Mesopotamia. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.